Boa noite. Sejam todas e todos bem-vindos ao Seminário Internacional Democracia em Colapso, uma realização do Sesc São Paulo e da Boitempo, com apoio da Fundação Rosa Luxemburgo, da Fundação Maurício Grabois, da Claxo, e com promoção de Folha de São Paulo, Revista Marie Claire Brasil, Revista 451, Carta Capital e Rede Brasil Atual. E agora, para dar início à palestra Feminismo Negro e a Política do Empoderamento, convidamos ao palco a mediadora Winnie Bueno, Raquel Barreto e Patrícia Rui Collins. Boa noite. Vocês estão tão felizes e tão excitados quanto eu. Eu estou assim, que eu não estou me aguentando. Queria, então, antes de mais nada, agradecer a honra é, de fazer essa mesa com a doutora Patrícia Hill Collins, cujo pensamento informa toda a minha pesquisa de mestrado já concluída e que irá se transformar no livro Imagens de Controle, um conceito do pensamento de Patrícia Hill Collins, com o um lançamento previsto para novembro. Também... <risos> Também quero agradecer imensamente à editora Boitempo por ter pensado essa mesa com carinho e cuidado com a relevância da obra de Patrícia Hill Collins, trazendo para comentar a conferência da doutora Collins, a pesquisadora Raquel Barreto, doutoranda em História pela Universidade Federal Fluminense, especialista no pensamento de mulheres negras, sobretudo nos contributos intelectuais de ativistas como Angela Davis e Lélia Gonzalez. Raquel é uma teórica que possui relevante aprofundamento a respeito das temáticas centrais das epistemologias feministas negras, comprometida em analisar as trajetórias e agendas políticas das ativistas negras com respeitabilidade e rigor teórico. Nesse sentido, também é uma honra dividir esse espaço contigo, Raquel, uma intelectual ativista negra da contemporaneidade, que também inspira a minha prática intelectual. Então... A mim aqui cabe fazer uma breve introdução à vida e à obra desta mulher, que, enfim, é uma das intelectuais ativistas mais importantes da história do feminismo negro, uma teórica crítica cuja relevância ultrapassa seus inúmeros prêmios e titulações, primeira mulher negra a presidir a Associação Americana de Sociologia, a doutora Patrícia Hill Collins sempre destacou a importância de compreendermos os contornos dos significados dos pioneirismos e da representatividade única, que muitas vezes faz com que, conforme ela mesma nos alertou recentemente num café da manhã, percamos o foco nos flashes das selfies para as redes sociais. Apesar de as estruturas de conhecimento ainda serem controladas por uma elite de homens brancos que define as premissas para a validação do conhecimento, fazendo com que os interesses e paradigmas articulados por esse grupo se sobreponham a outras perspectivas, o critério de valorização do conhecimento utilizado por Patricia Hill Collins se volta às mulheres negras como agentes do conhecimento, tendo a comunidade negra como possibilidade de tensionar os padrões vigentes e constituir marcos de validação do pensamento teórico que estejam alicerçados em critérios que tenham por centro as dimensões do pensamento de mulheres negras. Nesse sentido, o compromisso intelectual e político com a comunidade negra, sobretudo com as mulheres negras, é uma característica importante das epistemologias feministas negras. Os temas centrais do feminismo negro, bem como os paradigmas que articulam essa teoria de conhecimento, assim como as questões relacionadas às estratégias desenvolvidas pelas coletividades de mulheres negras para a construção da justiça social, são abordados na obra O Pensamento Feminista Negra, um clássico, que quase 30 anos após o lançamento de sua primeira edição, chega ao público brasileiro em português, o que muito nos alegra, mas que também evidencia como que o pensamento de mulheres negras é suprimido e ocultado da produção acadêmica brasileira. Uma vez que outras obras importantes no campus dos estudos feministas são traduzidas quase que instantaneamente, com muito menor morosidade. A gente espera, inclusive, que o último... Livro da doutora Patrícia Hill Collins, A Interseccionalidade enquanto Teoria Social Crítica, não leve 30 anos para ser traduzido. Bom, contudo, o descaso editorial não barrou a circulação do pensamento de Patrícia Hill Collins no Brasil. As próprias intelectuais negras brasileiras, como Luísa Bairros, mas mais recentemente também como Ana Cláudia Jaqueto Pereira e Cláudia Pons Cardoso, 
se responsabilizaram em adotar conceitos desenvolvidos por Patricia Hill Collins em seus contributos intelectuais, fazendo com que o pensamento produzido por Collins chegasse às academias brasileiras, ainda que suas obras não fossem traduzidas. Patricia Hill Collins nos ajuda a compreender a intelectualidade para além dos muros da academia, entendendo as experiências de autoinscrição de mulheres negras para além dos registros organizados em teses e dissertações. A teoria crítica produzida por Patricia Hill Collins se estabelece para muito além dos limites estabelecidos pelos grupos dominantes. Pensar a teoria crítica como uma possibilidade de reflexão das experiências de luta por direitos de grupos subalternos tem sido algo que tem articulado as minhas pesquisas acadêmicas a partir dos marcos conceituais apresentados por Patricia Hill Collins, organizados a partir da perspectiva de mulheres negras, mas que podem ser utilizados para pensar outras experiências de luta por emancipação, como as que ocorrem, por exemplo, no interior do movimento LGBT e também no interior dos movimentos de trabalhadores e trabalhadoras pobres brancos. A construção teórica de Patricia Hill Collins e o um pensamento feminista negro elucida os mecanismos que negam a cidadania para mulheres negras a despeito da igualdade formal perante a lei, constituindo-se enquanto um ferramental sociológico importante para compreender como que os sistemas de dominação articulam ferramentas que visam frustrar o processo de construção da subjetividade de mulheres negras. Patricia Hill Collins abarca uma série de formulações intelectuais produzidas por teóricas negras para organizar os conceitos desenvolvidos em sua obra. Os argumentos desenvolvidos por teóricas como Angela Davis, Barbara Smith, Kimberly Crenshaw e Elizabeth Ribotton aparecem ao lado de outras intelectuais negras que não são reconhecidas enquanto acadêmicas, mas que produzem conhecimento e pensamento feminista negro para além das fronteiras das universidades, como Aretha Franklin, Toni Morrison, Ella Baker, Nina Simone, Soulja Sister e Sueli Carneiro. O pensamento feminista negro não é uma novidade. Embora sua visibilidade tenha aumentado nas últimas décadas, o feminismo negro não se constitui de forma responsiva ao feminismo branco e tampouco é um mero desdobramento dele. Patricia Hill Collins é uma teórica que apresenta um contínuo de pensamento dinâmico. Percebo que suas primeiras contribuições teóricas são marcadas por uma defesa da experiência de mulheres negras como possibilidade teórico-crítica e metodológica para a sociologia do conhecimento, em um segundo momento, a autora passa a investigar com maior afinco, e aqui eu estou sendo ousada, né? porque ela está sentada do lado, ela pode dizer se você não entendeu nada. Você organizou tudo errado. Em segundo momento, a autora passa a investigar com maior afinco as estratégias políticas e ativistas institucionais de mulheres negras para a persecução da justiça social, sobretudo na obra Fighting Words, estando bastante imersa nessas discussões até o presente momento. Outra dimensão importante do trabalho teórico de Patricia Hill Collins está em sua persistência em demonstrar como que o conhecimento é uma ferramenta importante de empoderamento, a qual é fortalecida pelo ativismo intelectual de mulheres negras. Por fim, o compromisso de Patricia Hill Collins em demonstrar que a interseccionalidade é uma teoria crítica capaz de provocar mudanças sociais é uma marca distintiva de seu pensamento. Por tudo isso, com muito a honra, respeito e imensa alegria, Passo a palavra para Patrícia Hill Collins, uma mulher que produz teoria crítica para a justiça social a partir da centralidade das experiências e do pensamento feminista negro, sem alienar-se de si mesma. Olá. That's it. We are now going to continue in English, for me at least. It's an interesting and wonderful moment to sit on this stage and see you, how wonderful you look, how enthusiastic you are, and to realize that this is one step in my journey in doing my intellectual work and what I describe as intellectual activism. I've been pretty consistent throughout my career I like your rendition. <laughs> But to others, it's really appeared that I've jumped around. Sometimes I'm talking about knowledge. Sometimes I'm talking about politics. Sometimes I'm talking about race. Other times I'm talking about gender and sexuality. Surprisingly, I have written about class, although people in the United States don't really pay much attention to that, or as much as they should. I've written a fair amount on nationalism. I read fiction, I dance, I sing. <laughs> But then, I'm getting up in age. 
So I've had time to do all of these things, not all at the same time and not all on the same day. Because what I see from where I sit now and where I stand now is the long-term nature of intellectual work and political struggle. So that wherever you are in that particular journey is an important point in time and space, whether you're just starting out or if it's a situation like mine where you're thinking about the concept of legacy. What am I leaving behind? What am I leaving for you? It's time for me to get even more serious than I've been because I think the issues that I write about, that I think about, that I speak about are quite... This is what happens when you say something like this. <laughs> you lose electricity, you lose volume. I once was giving a talk, we lost everything. We were completely in the dark and I kept going because the mic worked. All right. We may have to come back to that. <clears throat> so for me, looking back and realizing that Black Feminist Thought was my first book, I wrote this book when I didn't know what I was doing at all. It really seemed like a good idea, but it was so much work to push myself to make this analysis. I never dreamed that it would travel as far as it has, and I certainly did not anticipate that it would have this longevity of three decades. But that means when you do intellectual and political work, you have to be analytical about yourself. You have to be self-reflexive about your own ideas, your own practice, and your own performance. No one is harder on me than me. So in that spirit, I look back on my own work and say, what's in black feminist thought that I think is worth really talking about? What's at the heart of it? What do I think we need to develop more? Where is it going? And those types of questions. So the question for me may be a question for you that's a little more um, pragmatic. How do you keep going in everyday life? Not just dur during times of success, but times of failure. We're in a moment now, politically, that is actually very scary for a lot of people. How do you keep going when there is no guarantee of victory? When there is no sense that you will win? How do you get up every day and do the work that needs to be done? I've had to think about that question a lot because I've seen successes and failures, both intellectually and politically. But when I think about that question, I think about all of the black women in my community where I grew up, a big city, in the United States who got up every day and went to work. They had jobs that were not exciting, where they were underpaid, where they were not recognized, and they still did that work because it was important for some reason to keep going. So my talk tonight really looks at that behavior of persistence, of commitment, and focuses on what that says to us about the politics of empowerment. The politics that I will talk about tonight are not so much the formal politics of political ideology. I will not be giving a talk on the good ideas in democracy or the bad ones. I will not be talking about neoliberalism and how it has destroyed the world. 
I will not be talking about corruption in government. All of those things matter. I will be talking about a politics of empowerment that looks at the world from the bottom up and has found a way to persist even under extremely difficult situations. Are you still with me? Okay. Ooh, okay, I like that, all right. <laughs> so this perpetual striving that I'm talking about, this keeping going, this persistence has been, even in the face of pushback from others, has been the reality for people on the bottom of social hierarchies of race, class, gender, sexuality, and ethnicity, among others. I look to the people on the bottom, not as data or examples for other theories, but rather for the theoretical brilliance that is there about how to imagine things like democracy, because that's where the future of it lies. So today, let me talk a little bit about, I have this lovely talk written up, and I just didn't know whether I wanted to read it or not. So I may read part of it, and I may talk part of it, and some of it may make you uncomfortable, but other parts of it may make you excited. I don't know. You know yourself better than I do, all right? So you do you, and I will do me, all right? <laughs> The first part of my talk really asks the question, why black feminism? I do not believe that black feminism is derivative of a general discourse on feminism. It's not a black version of something that's already true. I do not see black feminism as um, unusual, so unusual and unique that we become exotic black feminists who can be celebrated, I see it as something that comes from the lived experiences of black women, the lived material experiences and historical experiences. And the expression I will use is the reality of precarious black lives. There has been no guarantee under racism that black people will survive. Black lives have not been valued, but it's been worse than that. They've been precarious. As a new world people, the very category of African American or black people was created in the context of global capitalism and its reliance on slavery as a social institution of racial domination and class exploitation. There were no black people before these systems. There were Africans, there were Africans of different ethnicities, but there were no black people. The notion of black people is a creation of the new world, where in the United States we have had to craft a new identity from blackness that is different than the identity of blackness that was given to us. And central to this whole process, this whole material crafting, is the concept of captivity. That's a term that I use a lot more now because I think many people can relate to the notion of captivity when women are held captive by their abusive husbands and they cannot leave their houses, we see that as captivity. Slavery was captivity. Mass incarceration today is a form of captivity. Ghettoization is a form of captivity, as was Jim Crow discrimination in the United States. What does it mean when you hold a people captive and you take everything away from them? Now, it's important to keep in mind that people do not go willingly, nor do they stay willingly, 
in captivity. This has to be reinforced and reproduced and managed. And violence has been an important technology for domination under captivity. Violence has informed social practices that force people to stay in their assigned places. And this notion of domination and violence has been much more visible to those on the bottom than those on the top, to people who are actually held captive, who do not see opportunities, who cannot escape, and who fear violence if they or their loved ones get out of their place. Now, I'm talking about racism and slavery and black people in the US. But these issues are broader in terms of how other systems of domination are organized and how they operate. From enslavement to the present, black people in the US have grappled with the challenge of the ever-present threat of death death of oneself and death of one's loved ones. This theme of being held in captivity and being forced to face death constitutes an existential threat for black people in America, and we can discuss whether it is a similar situation in places like Brazil. Thus, for individuals and for black people as a collectivity in the US, being and becoming black rests on the terms on which we come to deal with this existential threat to our very existence. When people can kill your children and nothing happens, when people can kill your spouses and they are not punished, when people can kill you and people are afraid to speak up and come get your body later, you don't have to kill everyone. You simply have to have so much fear that that's one way of controlling a population held captive. Now, this notion of living an expendable or a precarious black life seems extremely grim. You're probably saying, oh my god, I hadn't thought about it that way because we have been deluged with images of the people on the bottom don't really care, they're happy, they deal with it, they're long-suffering, they deserve it. The ideology and the rhetoric that explains this raw power is quite pervasive, powerful, and does not go away. So what do you do if you're faced with that situation? Ah, oh, interestingly, Black people did not succumb, black people survived. The construct of freedom reflects the political aspirations of people who experience these relations of captivity. Now freedom is a term that is much bandied about in Western social theory. But I'm starting from a different reality to talk about this notion of freedom and those of you who might jump ahead to the end of the talk and its implications for democracy. The term freedom has special resonance within African American communities, such that black politics has routinely been described as a freedom struggle. This is not just a misnomer. Oh, we're using the term freedom for you know, fancy reasons but because it was literally a freedom struggle to become emancipated from slavery and continuing a freedom struggle through these other and ever-changing notions of captivity and domination. This is a long haul struggle. This is not for the faint of heart. The word may, captivity may have disappeared over time, but the technologies that maintain captivity, violence, and the outcomes of captivity, racial subordination, have not. So the political challenge for African Americans has been in finding ways to survive 
within the changing contours of captivity, to protest the ever-changing practices of domination that uphold it, as well as imagining alternatives to our current realities. Are you still with me? You had to hear this part in order to understand that this is where black feminism is rooted, right? It's not rooted in the individual psyche of the brilliant fiction writer. It's there, but this is why it exists, to deal with these big existential questions of live life and death. So why black feminism? Well, it should be clear that this is the context for the emergence of black feminism as well as its changing contours over time. These existential questions of death and violence are shared by African American women and men and they take gender specific forms. When one is aspiring toward freedom, there is no generic black person. Instead, there are heterogeneous uh, expressions of black people who, if you want freedom for the collectivity, you have to think about freedom for the groups within. Black women were one of the first to recognize the gendered nature of violence as a technology of domination. Many of us are familiar with the history of rape and um, I don't need to go through all of those examples, but the sexual violence that was done to black women for profit, for pleasure, for whatever reasons, is a gender specific form of violence than what was done to men. One is not better or worse than the other, they are in fact different. So it makes no sense to think about freedom for black people without thinking about what that means for both black men and black women. Thus creating and recognizing the gender specific nature of experiencing captivity and of resisting it of experiencing racism and sexism together and resisting them. Thus starting in that experience of captivity when you had no control over your own body, no rights whatsoever, the beginning of a discourse of black feminism that is both intellectual and political at the same time. How nice it would be if we could leave all the ugly past parts behind. But if you look around you and you can see these same relations today, you realize that this is a living, breathing discourse with a long history. Now, I could go through many examples from black feminism and identify these larger philosophical questions of the existential challenges of the precariousness of black life and of violence as a technology of domination. So I will just say this and just mention a few names. Violence against oneself, against one's loved ones, and or members of black communities has often been a catalyst for black feminist analysis and for black feminist politics. There are so many examples of people who one day were just trying to live and survive and either witnessed violence, experienced violence, and saw how unjust it was. So that lies at the heart. Someone like Ida Wells Barnett, who many of you may have heard of, who in the late 1890s was very disturbed by friends that she had who were lynched and nothing happened. And she became an anti-lynching crusader and in her work, her journalistic work, she argued that racism and sexism went together, that it was the race and the gender of the men who were lynched that was significant. She really put forth what we would consider now the beginnings of an intersectional argument, and she was fierce. So you can learn about it. She needs to be translated into Portuguese, all right? 
Angela Davis, who will be speaking at this conference in a few days, has clearly been an intellectual leader in this whole area of looking at violence and domination and captivity. Her work on race, class, gender, intersectionality, capitalism, and slavery is very significant in framing my argument and that of many other uh, thinkers. So there you see this existential threat that exists in gender-specific forms. And if we look to more contemporary political projects, the Black Lives Matter movement brings this forward into today, from race and gender connections to race, gender, class connections, to race, class, gender, sexuality, to race, class, gender, sexuality, and quote, beyond. Now, what I'm doing is overgeneralizing quite a bit here. But just to let you know that what you see within black feminism is a progression of analysis that continues to deal with the heterogeneity among black people asking the question, what will it take for black people to be free? You can't just have one segment free and the other segment isn't. You cannot have someone's freedom predicated upon someone else's subordination. And that's fundamentally what many of us have become comfortable with. But within this thing called black feminism, this tradition of intellectual and political resistance, there has been a continual get up every morning, go to work, and the work of crafting these ideas. What will it take for black people to be free? They're not free until black women are free. What will it take for black people to be free? Well, you can't have free black men and free black women and still have subordinated black people who are LGBTQ. Can't have that. What will it take for black people to be free? Well, only the middle class black people get to be free. What about the poor black people? I mean, so you get within this particular discourse over time, not an epiphany of ideas, but you get the slow, steady, every day working at this, all right? So hopefully I've convinced you that black feminism is in fact not white feminism. Okay, now. This is not to say that there's anything wrong with white feminism, but what it is saying is that all of the different political projects that are out there who, that claim to be social justice projects have to do this type of interrogation and archeology span that I am doing now with black feminism. You have to do the work around your own discourse and deal with what that means, especially questions of domination and subordination within your own discourse. So, having said that, now let's move on. Boy, I didn't think I was gonna be quite this serious, but apparently that's how I'm feeling tonight. So you're just gonna have to live with it, all right? But now I wanna move on to the second part of my talk. The first part I've given you a sense of a narrative of just the feel of black feminist thought and why, setting the stage for why you get a certain type of politics and certain types of issues. For the second part of my talk, I want to focus on what I'm going to call four core ideas of black feminist thought. And these ideas stem from this context that I've described to you very generally. Um, and they highlight I how black women have responded to these challenges, these existential challenges that I have identified. So in this section, I take a closer look at how the content of black feminism as a set of ideas and a set of practices has been shaped by and or responded to these existential concerns. So the first core idea of black feminist thought might surprise you 
based on how I've presented it thus far. And it is a politics of hope. Why would you be engaged in politics at all if you did not hope that things could be different, better, if you were not hopeful in some way? Now, one would think if you were black women at the bottom and life is terrible, all of those kinds of things, it seems to suggest that you would capitulate and become, you would give up. But I started with these women in my neighborhood who didn't give up, who kept going. What kept them going? Now, I don't mean hope like smiling Polly Annish, oh, I'm so hopeful. I don't mean all that stuff you see on television. I mean something that's deep in the fabric of people. And I'm gonna suggest that black women carry hope in a particular way. Hope brings meaning to life for everyone. Do you choose life or death? All right, what are you gonna choose, life or death? And I've argued, I had to come back and look at my own work, because I've spent a lot of time looking at motherhood and mother work. That does not mean that one must become a mother biologically, which is a wonderful thing if that's what you want to do. But it is to say that the act of having to care for someone else's life you have to ask yourself the question, what am I doing? Am I, why would I bring this child into the world if the world is a world of captivity and the threat of death? There is hope there. Mother work to me is evidence for hope, if not for yourself, but for your children and through them bring meaning to your life. Now, many black women have had mothers like this, grandmothers like this, women like this, who have said to them, do not give up. Baby, you are beautiful. You are amazing. You are precious. The rest of the world may not see that, but I see that in you. And the possibilities over time for that beauty to be seen and shown vary, but the message of hope had to have been there, or how do you survive the brutality of slavery? How does that happen? How do you survive captivity if you do not hope that you will not always be there in it, or that your children will not always be there? How do you prepare people for a life you have not lived? That's hope. It's not like hope for just me. But how do you prepare that? When I think about my own mother, my mother had a difficult life. She was an artist with no way to express her art. She loved music. She loved fiction. She loved all the things that black women shouldn't love. She was a secretary. That was very good for when I was growing up. But she had a job where each year, men passed over her. She had to train her bosses, and then they were her bosses. Oh, chefe, is that the word? All right, in Portuguese? <laughs> I like that word. I'm learning that one early. All right. <laughs> I mean, she had to train her bosses, and each day, see her own dreams get smaller and smaller and smaller. And my mother suffered from depression. Because that is what happens to a lot of people, or addiction, or all the things that wear you down. But what she gave me was a sense of, if not me, there may be hope, I have hope for you, even though none of us can see the future. So I think something that lies at the center of black feminism and black feminist thought is this ethos of hope that will not go away, because people get up every day and behave as if it is real. A second core idea. Oh, are you still there? I have to check from time to time. Is anyone sleeping next to you? Wake them up, all right. 
Especially if they're snoring. That's really embarrassing for me. <laughs> okay. So we've got this way that ideas and actions can make a statement about us that we're hopeful. This is very important in difficult times. All right? But the second core idea I've already foreshadowed, and that is what we're now calling this notion of intersectionality. This term did not exist 30 years ago. This is a new term, but it's a set of old ideas of thinking about, it is an analysis of the social world to make sense of the social world and your own experiences in it. Now, one feature of racism is to convince black people that we don't think. What we do is natural. Basketball players, or I suppose soccer players here, football players here in Latin America, have natural ability, like animals or antelopes or things like that. As opposed to, there is embedded in the life world of subordinated groups, analysis that helps them deal with their experiences in the world. And I've shared the experiences of captivity, but there are others who are on the bottom where the structures of power may not be the same ones that I am describing today. This kind of awareness, this kind of analysis requires developing an awareness of your own social context, the situations that you are in, and how that social context shapes your experiences. Now, uh, this is the sociologist in me talking. I realize that. Some of you may just want to run through life and not think about any of this stuff and just say, can't we just have cafe? <laughs> Whatever. Cerveja, probably, some of you. <laughs> Dois cervezas? Okay, no. <laughs> I know Portuguese cerveza in Portuguese. <laughs> Vinho, I know that one too. <laughs> Alcool, I learned that one too. Oh, sorry. Disculpe. <laughs> This awareness of your social context and analyzing the social world is the foundation of intersectionality. And for African American women, it has started with race, which is so obvious. But gender within race has moved to race and gender together and class influencing race and gender. It's been a journey, right, in terms of a deepening intersectional framework. Other groups may start in another place, but this is where I start this particular analysis. So the issue is developing analyses that make sense for you. So it never made any sense to me when I went to college and people said to me, black women are the problem in black communities. Black mothers are the problem in black communities. Black women are terrible. They drive away the men. They raise weak sons. They encourage their daughters to be bossy like them. I mean, this is just standard social science. I'm not even, I'm saying it colloquially, but this is really a whole discourse on the badness of black women. And I thought to myself, this does not match one bit what I see. This simply seems untrue to me but who has the power to decide what truth is? At that point, it wasn't me. But now, it's much more likely to be me. So I like that. And that is the process. That is the process of developing the analysis from the bottom up and doing the work and trusting your own experiences and your own analyses. So I don't see intersectionality as this fancy theory that has dropped from the sky that we all have to study and try and get right. I see it as something that has emerged from serious study and politics 
the seeing and the doing, social action as a form of knowledge, trying things out, and then analyzing how they went, and then planning something else. Intersectionality has fallen in that category for me. So over time, black women have been uniquely positioned to develop an intersectional analysis of the categories. Not all of them, not all at the same time, but they've been in a position to see it. A third core idea of black feminist thought is familiar to us all. And this is the notion of social justice. Now, one can hope for a better future. One can analyze the world and say, the world is full of social inequality. Look at the social inequality of blacks and whites, or men and women, or rich people and poor people, or straight people and not straight people, or whatever. But not take the position that that is wrong. There are many people who are comfortable with social inequality. They think that's fine. In fact, that's normal. And social equality is abnormal for them. Now what I'm saying here is that black feminist thought has long taken an ethical, moral position that social inequality is wrong and unfair. Now it should not need to be said, but as a person who has spent many years in the academy, I have had many colleagues who study inequality but you really never know what they think about it. It certainly means that they get jobs studying racial inequality or gender inequality, and their names are big names. But when it comes to taking a principled position about social justice, where are they? Now, black women historically have had no such choice. How can you take a principled position in favor of your own subordination? Oh, come back and abuse me some more, because I love me some inequality. Does that make any sense to you? No, all right? So you are compelled to think about inequality and what can be done about it. So here, a social justice framework is something that equips one to see dominant knowledge and to criticize it on its own terms. Some of it's extremely helpful, but a lot of it has been a problem, as I've just indicated. And for black women to develop a resistant knowledge or an oppositional knowledge that takes this on, that fundamentally says a resistant knowledge has taken a moral, polit ethical position that social inequality is wrong and unfair, and that we want to create knowledge that acknowledges that and that empowers. Still there? We're getting to the fourth point. There are only four, so, you know, I'm trying to make this as clear, precise as I can. Obviously, this is, these are complex, huge ideas. Right? But what I'm doing is trying to synthesize them to lay a foundation for a politics of empowerment that encompasses hope, that encompasses analysis, that encompasses an ethical framework of a commitment to social justice, that for black women would be part of an ongoing freedom struggle that is a response to captivity. So I come to this fourth point, and this has to do with political action. Political action is my fourth point. Now we're used to thinking in very hmm, particular ways, narrow ways often about political action. But I want to talk expansively about the possibilities for political action if one comes at the world with these existential questions and threats. What actions are possible when life's meaning is informed by this constellation of hope, analysis, and ethics? That's at the heart 
of black feminism, that combination. Politics becomes strategic. It's not hardwired. There's no one right way to do politics. There's no ideology that has all the answers. Like a cookbook, you know, like you just get your ideology out and you say, ooh, point one, let's do this and we will be free tomorrow. Utopia is coming, hey, three more things, and then we'll be there. It doesn't work that way. An ongoing political struggle is really asking questions about the strategies that are appropriate for a given point in time facing a particular set of challenges and to foreshadow. We're in one of those times when people are thinking about political possibilities differently. So strategic possibilities, rethinking the notion of the political, well, I think what we really need is flexibility. Flexibility in politics and to ask the question, what kind of flexibility is most useful for a given set of challenges? So I'm gonna do now, I'm going to do now, a schema, or just a quick list of just naming kinds of politics, all right? and just seeing if you would think about this as political at all. I'm gonna start with something called survival politics. If you don't survive, there is no more politics. And very often the struggle for survival is seen as something natural that you just do. Almost like we're in the wild and animals try and survive, that's all they know, that's all they know how to do. I think survival politics are actually quite um, hmm, sophisticated because when you look at black women and survival politics, the efforts to survive yourself and to help others survive is really the foundation of altruism. It's the foundation of love. It requires a complex set of skills to decide that you will commit to the survival of black people, especially if you are in a culture that is, commit, that is not committed to that at all. When people kill your children, if you are committed to their survival, that is a political act, to recognize it that way. The notion of all we have is each other, people who have very little material possessions, but they know they have each other, and that's central to survival. The struggle to, to create community is central to survival politics, if only to protect the vulnerable from threats that are outside. This particular struggle for survival, I would argue, precedes democracy. It's fundamental to it, and it may outlive it. Democracy may come and go, but survival is basic. I have so many things on this survival list, but I'm gonna come back to that in the future. A second dimension or piece of politics is what I call cultural politics. Now we often don't see culture as politics necessarily. We don't see creating beauty. We don't see creating art and drama and fiction and poetry and hip hop and music and rapping and tagging and all those aspects of cultural politics in African American life and culture as political. We see that as just art. But anything that empowers people by nurturing the soul is in fact a form of politics. Cultural politics can just appear to be entertainment and that certainly is what commodity capitalism wants to turn it into. But it's never just that. Back to this in a minute. We are much more familiar with identifying real politics with protest politics. That's the organized protest against some greater wrong. And this is important. To get to a point where it's safe enough to protest, how do you have protest politics when you are chattel and you have no rights? 
So when you get to the point where you have rights, where you can protest collectively and in an organized fashion, that's an important milestone. Getting to keep that is something different entirely. And I'm skipping examples here, but this fourth category, formal politics. People in political science often misrecognize government as politics. We filter so much through the lens of formal politics. But is that limiting our ability to see the interconnections between these various forms of political action that are always all there, but not necessarily in the same constellation? I'm going to argue, this is a thesis, in the times of, that we're in now of far-right populism, we're likely to see a reorganization of politics and political action, and perhaps a shifting relationship among these particular strategies of politics. And what's required is a flexibility to, con to move from one to the other and into one and out of the other depending on the needs that are there. Survival politics is the bedrock of black femi feminism. And surviving can be more or less difficult depending on the nature of the threat. Protest can become punished <clears throat> and become dangerous and go underground. It never goes away. It just goes underground. Protest persists but in forms far less visible. And then everyone thinks politics are dying. But that not, may not be the case at all. Formal politics has historically provided high barriers for black women's participation. But it's important to try. During times of repression, cultural politics may grow in significance as a place for criticism and imagination. Yet this politics may be overlooked, misunderstood, misidentified, and perhaps commodified and appropriated as being not political at all. So for example, in the US, there's all this amazing comedy coming out right now, satire, making fun of, that is indirect criticism of a lot in American culture. And it's a way of protesting and surviving and organizing all at the same time. And it's also safer than showing up with the placard and joining the organization. So this is why I would argue art and cultural politics are always important, important for subordinated groups. OK. Now we're going to finish this talk up any minute. Let me find out how long I'm going. Oh, you are so patient. <laughs> You would think I was holding church as much as I've been talking. You know how people get locked up hours on end in church. You know, they never get out, all right? They have a birthday in church. They're in there so long, that kind of thing. Okay, so just go to be. <laughs> Apparently, I need to know this word. So let me just wrap up by mentioning two big points. I can say more, but I wasn't sure how long I was going to take. What I'm arguing here is presenting a view of politics and the political that has been central to black women's survival. And I've laid out some important points that go back in time, that change form, that are there now, that provide opportunities for black women's empowerment. And as long as black women are subordinated, there will be a need for this kind of politics and for political action. You cannot expect people who are held in captivity not to want to be free. You have to expect that. And it's not just black women. Hopefully you can see the implications of this argument for many other groups with distinctive histories, right? But the implications I'd like to leave you with are two. And the first has to do with the implications of this politics of empowerment, just beginning to think about politics differently in terms of its very definition of political action. 
and how that might relate to what I see as a fundamental contradiction between democracy and inequality. Democracy, to me, is an ideal. We have not had it yet. The people who feel they have had it have been in formal politics. They have rights of citizenship. They are protected. But there are all of these other people who, like black women, who are struggling to put teeth into the democratic ideal. And this is especially apparent in the United States, which has a history of democracy and inequality that are deeply intertwined. The ideal of democracy, we're all equal. Come to America, you can be anything you want, little black girl in America, but that's not necessarily true. And on the other side, we have an inequality where someone's freedom and ability to claim democracy is predicated on someone else's unfreedom. Now, if we persist in not looking at the connection between these two, and we just want to force democracy as some big set of ideas that we just all have to get behind it and be in solidarity to fight for democracy, we may end up replicating the very same inequalities that are there all along, leaving many people along, behind. So there, just as there are no shortcuts to this politics of empowerment, there are no shortcuts for democracy. Zora Neale Hurston, in satire, said after World War II, she's an African-American writer, and she says, she says, they tell me that this democracy form of government is a wonderful thing. It has freedom, equality, justice, in short, everything. The radio, the newspapers, the columnists inside the newspapers have said how lovely it was. All this talk and praise given has got me in the notion to try some of this stuff. All I want is to get hold of a sample of that thing. And I declare, I sure will try it. Hurston is talking about the ongoing struggle. This is after a war for democracy that decimated a large number of people in the world and after black soldiers return home to America where they are still not free. There's no democracy at home. She says, boy, I would love some of that democracy because of the ideology of the US that says we are de democratic. So that was Hurston, there have been many others, but this whole notion of dealing with this fundamental contradiction and looking to a politics of empowerment for that, or black feminism providing a window for seeing what can happen on the ground around those issues. And the second, how might developing an expansive notion of political action provide tools for democratic participation? Are these tools that I have presented to you about survival politics and formal politics and, and uh, protest politics and cultural politics, this arsenal of tools, a way for us to recognize the ways in which people contribute differently to a broader democratic project or not? I'm not sure. Are the tools of black feminism around intersectionality? Do they give us space for thinking about concepts like solidarity? The view of solidarity that we just join hands and if we just stick together, we can conquer the world. That is the framework of protest politics. But if we look more broadly, perhaps we would see a more flexible solidarity that is strategic. Sometimes one is in solidarity, I'll use the example of black women, black women and black men have common interests, but sometimes they do not. And there is the need for an independent black feminist voice. 
So this notion of a heterogeneous or flexible solidarity becomes very important. So I don't know. I think asking about the implication of these tools. So as I move on and finish up, and now is the time for you to begin to cheer because you heard me say the word finish up, all right? <laughs> See there, that's it, all right. Oh, this group over here really wants me to finish up. Oh, people, <laughs> have you no, oh, you have no pity on me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the question I would like to leave us with is, is kind of um, where I started. How do we keep going at this particular time? How do we take this legacy of the past that's going to go into the future, that affects the present, and how do we think about where we are now at this point in time? For me, this period of time is one that says, if you think about this through the framework of black women, we've been here before and we may be here again at this type of moment. But what matters is what we do in the here and now. We are in the middle of a long arc of time. I started with captivity. That's a long arc of time. And hopefully you can see, this is not a one and done struggle. Just because you won on Tuesday does not mean it's going to work on Wednesday. When you are dealing with fundamental theft, it doesn't mean that what you have earned or gotten, you will get to keep it. Black history is full of all kinds of stories of accomplishments that were taken back. So this is not a new story. That does not mean that it is not a distressing story, but it does mean that what's past is prologue for what we do today. And what we do today is the past for those who come behind us, for those who are counting on us to get up every day and go to work, no matter what the cost to us. Thank you. Obrigada! Bom, eu derrubei todos os papéis aqui. E aí, no meio tempo em que eu junto os papéis, a Raquel vai fazer os comentários. Então, a gente ainda tem é, alguns minutos para a Raquel comentar enquanto eu organizo os papéis. E aí eu vou organizar as perguntas. Eu não vou ler todas, são muitas. Mas eu vou tentar organizar as temáticas das perguntas mais ou menos é, no mesmo caminho para que a gente possa, então, ouvir é, a doutora Collins a respeito uh, das, dos, das questões de vocês. Raquel, por favor. É, boa noite. Tudo bem com vocês? Eu tenho a, eu tenho a, a tarefa de comentar essa fala. Vocês sabem que a missão é... A, missão Árdua. Mas antes de comentar, tentar estabelecer algum diálogo com a fala da professora Patrícia Rio Collins, eu gostaria primeiro de agradecer a presença de vocês aqui nessa quarta-feira é, à noite. Vocês poderiam ter lugares mais interessantes para estar. Estamos aqui para conversar, escutar e aprender. Dizer que a plateia está linda. Daqui dá para ver ah, o retrato de vocês. Está muito bonita. É, gostaria de agradecer à editora Boitempo pelo convite, pela confiança depositada na minha pessoa. Obrigada. É, gostaria de agradecer ao Sesc, especificamente Sesc Pinheiros, que eu já tive a oportunidade de estar aqui em 2017, numa bela exposição do Emory Douglas e a Arte do, do Partido dos Panteras Negras, que foi uma exposição muito grande que teve aqui em 2017, participei de algumas atividades, e gostaria de agradecer é, ao pessoal que está trabalhando no Invisível, que fica aqui atrás, que faz que tudo isso aqui fique tão bonito e perfeito às vezes.
para que nós possamos estar aqui trocando, aprendendo, tem uns trabalhadores e trabalhadoras fazendo que essa mágica aconteça. Então é bom a gente não esquecer que tem trabalho envolvido nessa produção também. Agradecer a eles que estão aí atrás. É, quando eu pensei essa conversa com a professora, com a obra, né, com, a, com a produção, especialmente com o livro, né, esse livro que a gente teve a fortuna agora de ter, ter a tradução em português, eu queria discutir algumas coisas, é, algumas temáticas que eu achava que se aplicava, que eu considero que se aplica ao nosso contexto atual, e algumas questões que poderiam atravessar política, poder e democracia, mas pensando democracia a partir de outros lugares. né? E a primeira coisa que a gente tem, que eu gostaria de nomear é que eu considero a teoria que a professora Patrícia Rio Collins desenvolveu e outras mulheres negras como um exercício de desobediência epistêmica. né? A, a produção teórica que mulheres negras têm é, desenvolvido ao longo da história, desde o momento, como nomeou a professora Patrícia Rio Collins, que nós nós nos tornamos negros e negras, porque essa foi uma, cons, uma construção... É, da diáspora, né? em África, os nossos antepassados não eram negros e negras, eles pertenciam aos seus grupos, aos seus povos. A condição de negros e negras foi uma condição que a escravidão nos relegou. Da mesma forma que os povos originários que habitavam esse território não eram índios, eles eram, eram e são pertencentes às suas nações. Então, é bom a gente ter em mente que essas nomeações foi o poder branco que nos instituiu, que deu esses nomes para gente. É, então, esse era um primeiro ponto. E o que eu chamo de des desobediência epistêmica, a teoria proposta pela professora Patrícia Rio Collins, eu não consigo chamar ela de não ser professora, porque é mestre, né? eu estou aqui do lado, já tomei café com ela, já de manhã vou contar essa intimidade, mas continua sendo... Continua sendo... Continua sendo a professora. É, e ela é a simpatia nos bastidores também, tá, gente? Não é, não é, não é fake, não, é real. É... <risos> É, essa tradição que mulheres negras têm desenvolvido, ela, ela é uma, corresponde a uma desobediência epistêmica, porque ela rompe com ideias, é, rompe com tradições de políticas, é, tradições políticas originárias, como é, uma tradição teórica crítica, que a gente poderia chamar de marxismo, ou quem sabe de anar ou anarquismo, outro, outros pensamentos políticos no campo da esquerda, das esquerdas, rompe com é, teorias políticas negras que não dão contas. Da, da, da posição das mulheres negras, rompe com o chamado feminismo, que eu vou chamar aqui hegemônico, para não chamar de feminismo branco, que eu acho que empobrece um pouco. É, todo esse, esse framework, né, a palavra que eles usam em inglês, para dar conta, é um exercício de desobediência epistêmica que rompe com, com definições tradicionais. E o exercício que a Patrícia Hill Collins faz no livro dela é um exercício que a gente precisa fazer é, no Brasil de mapear é, de construir uma genealogia, de olhar para trás e saber que legados nos informam. né? Porque é, a discussão do feminismo negro não começou nessa geração, não começou pós políticas e ações afirmativas. Nós temos um grande legado de outras mulheres que vieram antes de nós e construíram o caminho para que nós hoje estivéssemos aqui. Então, essa é uma luta é, de gerações, é aquela frase repetitiva, é, repetida muitas vezes, nem sempre entendida, que os nossos passos vêm de longe, significa que, antes de nós, outras mulheres negras vieram. E, necessariamente, tudo que elas produziram possa ser chamado de feminismo negro, né? porque, às vezes, a gente corre em algumas é, incorreções teóricas, mas é dizer que nós temos um pensamento desenvolvido por mulheres negras que pensam sua própria condição e pensam a condição da sua comunidade, lançam um olhar sobre si, sobre mulheres, e lançam um olhar sobre a sua comunidade, lançam um olhar para o mundo, fazem um exercício triplo de análise e identificação. Né? O pensamento desenvolvido por mulheres negras tem muito a ver com resistência, porque são formas é, pensadas individual e coletivas, coletivas de resistir ao mundo da supremacia branca, ao mundo do capital, ao mundo da heteronormatividade do patriarcado. São, são exercícios é, coletivos. Um aspecto importante na produção da professora Patrícia é a ideia da reconquista da voz, né, de ter uma voz de autodefinição. E, às vezes, esse conceito pode ser banalizado, mas ele tem um conceito muito potente, porque, para fazer qualquer tipo de política, eu preciso me anunciar, eu preciso ter uma voz própria, uma construção própria, um lugar no mundo para pensar o mundo. E aí a gente sempre lembra, toda vez que fala da construção de discurso, eu lembro muito... É, muito de uma autora, de uma teórica que, que a minha é muito cara e muito amada, que se chamou Lélia Almeida Gonzalez. É, dia 10 de julho, completou 25 anos da partida da Lélia, 
é, ela, ela é a teórica que, antes de que se falasse hoje muitas coisas que muitas das jovens consideram que são novidades, grandes novidades, ela já falava nos anos 70 e 80 e se organizava na coletividade. É, e um, um texto muito conhecido, um texto muito conhecido de Lélia, o racismo e o sexismo na cultura brasileira, começa com aquela frase, aquela, aquela espécie de anedota, descrição da realidade, que ela fala que é aquela neguinha que queria sentar na mesa. E as pessoas sempre ficam muito, evidenciam muito a questão do discurso, né? porque, vocês sabem, é um texto, é, era uma festa de branco muito legal, e aí os brancos fazem uma mesa falando dos negros, e a plateia toda negra fica observando os brancos falarem sobre os negros. Uma coisa que vocês nunca viram, mas acontece. E aí aquela mesa bonita, não chamaram os negros para sentar, e aí uma hora que chamam a neguinha abusada, como a Lélia se define, ela pega o microfone e faz um discurso todo contra os brancos, aí é um texto anedótico, a neguinha abusada é a Lélia, aquilo tem uma autoficção dela mesmo, mas a gente sempre se atém muito ao fato do discurso, o discurso que anuncia, o discurso que impulsiona a mobilização coletiva. Mas tem um outro detalhe muito importante, aquele discurso ele é necessário porque ele, a metáfora das cadeiras, a mesa, são as relações estruturais. E para que a Lélia sentasse ali, ou para que outras pessoas negras que estavam na plateia sentasse, aquela mesa, a arrumação daquela mesa precisaria ser mudada. Então, essa é uma imagem muito importante que a gente perde quando lê essa epígrafe da Lélia, porque o que interessa são as relações de poder que sustentam a mesa, as relações de poder são estruturais. E esse discurso só faz sentido se ele mexe com essas cadeiras, se todos podem sentar nessa mesa, se só uns poucos podem sentar ou se só uns poucos podem pegar o microfone para responder perguntas e falar eventualmente, esse discurso não vale, o discurso só tem efeito se ele muda as relações de poder, se ele muda a arrumação da cadeira. Então, é, é, eu queria é, iniciar com é, trazer essa imagem da Lélia, que eu acho que é muito potente para pensar a autoenunciação, para além de um exercício importante de descoberta, de fala de si, mas um exercício que move e que move estruturas. É, uma outra preocupação que eu tenho, é, eu estudo, eu faço doutorado agora, é, estudo a história, eu estudo Partido dos Panteras Negras e a, a, e a visualidade que envolve o Partido dos Panteras Negras. Então, eu sou a pessoa que me dedico a estudar a história dos Estados Unidos. Porém, no entanto, contudo, todavia, eu me preocupo muito com a forma que a teoria produzida nos Estados Unidos tem sido recepcionada no Brasil de forma colonizada. A gente precisa ter uma reflexão crítica, é, para que essa, pra, inclusive para que essa teoria possa ter mais força e ter mais serventia. Nem tudo que os afro-americanos e afro-americanas falam, teoriza valem para a gente. A gente tem um dado assim, muito importante nessa relação. Eles são numericamente uma minoria. Nós somos a maioria da população negra brasileira. Isso é um dado que a gente perde quando faz esse debate e, 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 e transporta essas teorias de forma acrítica. Então, eu, eu gostaria de mencionar isso, que a gente tivesse um cuidado quando pensar nessas teorias de forma crítica, não fazer uma recepção colonizada é, do que é tudo que é produzido nos Estados Unidos, nem tudo que é produzido lá vai servir para a nossa realidade brasileira. É, eles, enquanto eles estavam lidando nos anos é, até até a lei dos direitos civis de 64 e a lei dos direitos civis de 65 que instituiu o voto de 64 que define é, os direitos civis 65 que define o voto e a que eu acho mais importante que é a de 68 que define o direito à não discriminação na compra e no aluguel de casas que é onde vem o dinheiro né sua família vai comprar casa boa seu patrimônio vai acumular que é a de 68 eles têm uma forma de racismo aberto, uma forma de racismo de segregação que funcionava nos estados do sul, chamado Jim Crow. Nós vivíamos, nesse mesmo período, um racismo de denegação, como a Lélia falava. Né? O racismo que marca o Brasil e as experiências na América Latina é um racismo de negação. Então, só a partir desse ponto, que eles estão tratando de um sistema de supremacia aberta, enquanto nós estamos lidando com um sistema de racismo é, que nega que ele existe, tem um diferenças nessa teoria, no, nas respostas nas questões e nas respostas que essa teoria produz. Então, esse é um dado importante para a gente pensar, além da questão da estatística, da, 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 da proporção populacional de que nós somos é, e de que eles são. Além disso, é bom a gente é, pensar que essa própria tradição do feminismo negro ou a tradição do pensamento desenvolvido por mulheres negras no interior do movimento negro brasileiro, se fez presente em muitos, é, seguindo aquela cronologia clássica né, da historiografia que trabalha o movimento negro, no pós-abolição com, 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 com a imprensa negra, depois com a Frente Negra Brasileira aqui no, em São Paulo, 
depois, na década de 40 e 50, com o Teatro Experimental do Negro, e nos anos 70, com a chamada o Movimento Negro Contemporâneo, que esse que somos herdeiros, que esse Movimento Negro Contemporâneo, que fez em outras coisas que pessoas como eu, negras de pele clara, se reconhecessem como negra. Isso foi uma luta histórica que o Movimento Negro lutou como definição da negritude no Brasil. É bom a gente não perder de vista, e é bom a gente não perder de vista que ações afirmativas, que muitos de vocês aqui, eu, infelizmente, não tive idade para desfrutar ações afirmativas, tiveram a oportunidade de entrar na universidade graças às ações afirmativas, não foi política de um governo, foi política do movimento negro que esse governo, essa administração implementou. Essa são luta dos nossos e das nossas que antecedem. Né? Isso é bom a gente lembrar isso. É, e, e retomando a ideia de uma tradição de mulheres negras que se pensavam, na década de 40, no Teatro Experimental do Negro, é, fundado pelo Abdias do Nascimento, Guerreiro Ramos, uma pessoa super esquecida, um intelectual fantástico, que na década de 40 e 50 estava falando assim, que o racismo é uma problemática branca. Aí a gente escuta isso em 2018, a pessoa fala, você fala, uau, que máximo! Guerreiro Ramos já tinha cantado a pedra já há muito tempo. Então, a gente precisa se ligar a essa tradição que nos formou, é importante. É, eu sou chata com isso, sou historiadora, e fico repetindo essas coisas, assim, é, porque a gente tem uma tradição muito rica e poderosa que nos formou, que nos trouxe até aqui. E dentro dessa tradição, no Teatro Experimental do Negro, a gente tinha uma mulher chamada Maria Lourdes Vale do Nascimento, que assinava uma coluna no jornal do Teatro Experimental do Negro, Fala Mulher, o nome do jornal era Jornal do Quilombo, está disponível na internet, depois eu convido vocês a fazerem esse exercício de ler, ler o jornal do TEM, vocês vão encontrar várias contradições que, para hoje, é, na nossa concepção de relações raciais ou de negritude, são ideias que se chocam, mas, para a época, eram as ideias mais progressistas e avançadas é, do contexto. E, nesse momento, a, a Maria Lourdes Vale do Nascimento discutia participação política das mulheres negras, políticas, política institucionalmente falando, e, de, e defendia a regulamentação do trabalho doméstico. Nos anos 40, mulheres negras já discutiam sobre isso, dessa necessidade e da perpetuação e da continu, do contínuo histórico entre, o traba, entre escravidão, a ocupação da escravizada e as relações de trabalho pós-abolição, no caso da ocupação do trabalho doméstico, que é toda uma questão assim, muito especial no Brasil. A gente lembra que parte do engodo né, nesses, nesses anos de governo do PT foi a argumentação, a PEC das empregadas domésticas. Quanto isso destapou né, é, questões de quanto mal-estar gerou quando as pessoas souberam que tinha que pagar um salário mínimo, um, ao menos um salário mínimo para as empregadas e assinar a carteira, que, afinal de contas, elas eram trabalhadoras e que mereciam todas as garantias. Vocês se lembram todo o drama que isso gerou e todo, todo o resquício disso... É, estrutural do racismo das relações geradas lá na colônia, né, na, na plantation. É, eu, assim, pensando numa especificidade do, do feminismo negro brasileiro, lendo a professora, pensando, eu diria que nós, mulheres negras no Brasil, temos uma relação muito grande com a questão da territori territorialidade. Né? A experiência, muita da nossa experiência é constituída em territorialidade. É, isso vai fazer uma ponte para uma questão que eu queria trabalhar. A professora trabalha, desenvolveu o conceito de imagens de controle, né, que são um conceito assim, é, muito importante, que a Winnie trabalha, desenvolve é, muito bem, muito melhor do que eu vou, vou mencionar aqui. Mas, quando eu li o texto, eu fiquei pensando nas imagens de controle sobre as mulheres negras brasileiras na contemporaneidade. E aí uma dessas, especificamente, é a que eu gostaria de explorar hoje, porque ela pode, ela fala muito sobre democracia ou a falta de democracia. Essas imagens de controle são uma livre definição minha, sem nenhum insight, é, sem nenhuma pesquisa aprofundada. Então, estão a crivo de análises mais profundas. Mas a gente tem uma imagem recorrente na diáspora africana, que é a imagem hipersexualizada de pessoas negras, não só de mulheres negras, homens negros também são hipersexualizados na projeção do tamanho do pênis, na viralidade, né? que, por um lado, pode parecer para alguns homens que significam a projeção da sua sexualidade a um, algum tipo de poder, mas, o outro lado dessa moeda, a ideia de que homens negros são naturalmente estupradores. Né? Isso é um, 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 uma, um imaginário que circula não só o Brasil, mas que circula as diásporas dessa ideia do, do sexo sem controle. Né? Que, que povoa a representação, que funda a representação da masculinidade negra. É, e o outro lado desse é, é a hipersexualização da mulher negra. Uma dessas imagens, a histórica é a mulata assanhada, né, que está aí na cultura popular 
atual. Eu sou carioca, se vocês não repararam com esse meu sotaque, né? Eu estou falando agora. É, na minha cidade, a cultura do funk ela é muito marcada. Então, há permanentemente a, a denotação da funkeira. Quando a gente fala funkeira, não sei qual é o contexto de São Paulo, mas na minha cidade, você já imagina é, aquela, um, um tipo de menina negra com um tipo de roupa fazendo determinados movimentos. Né? Então, isso tudo é uma projeção sobre a sexualidade. No Rio, algum tempo atrás, tinha a história dos, dos bailes fãs, que as meninas ficavam grávidas, ninguém sabia como quem, no trenzinho. Uma série de coisas que são projeções, que é a classe média branca e a burguesia, ou os, os meios, o, a imprensa é, é muito responsável pela vinculação dessa imagem erotizada das meninas do funk. Essa é uma das imagens de controle. É, a outra mãe preta, mas que eu não vou ter tempo de problematizar, mas eu, eu compartilho do, da concepção de Lélia sobre a mãe preta, que é uma ideia mais complexa. Uma outra imagem, na imagem clássica, da neguinha barraqueira, né, que essa é totalmente ligada à territoriedade, é a neguinha do morro, favelada, barraqueira, aquela que vai vir aqui e fazer escândalo. É, a neguinha atrevida é aquela metida que se mete nos lugares que ela não deveria estar, e também tem a ver com o território, porque ela está aqui na universidade, levanta o dedo para falar toda hora, ela é muito abusada, metida, né? Isso aí, né, certo. Winnie? Vai embora. É... A dissertação tem tudo isso. <risos> e tem embora. outras duas mulheres que eram as que eu queria falar hoje, porque eu acho que elas falam muito desse nosso momento. Uma é a mãe, a mãe beneficiária do programa Bolsa Família. Ela não necessariamente é negra, mas ela não é branca. É aquela mulher lá do Nordeste, lá, sabe? Aquela que usa o Bolsa Família. Eles fazem um monte de filho para pegar o Bolsa Família. É! Aí você pergunta, você sabe quanto é que é o Bolsa Família? As pessoas nunca sabem quando é o Bolsa Família. Não, salário mínimo. Ela fez vários filhos para ganhar um salário mínimo do governo de cada filho. Né? E essa é uma imagem de controle, porque a gente sabe como isso foi mobilizado durante a, a última campanha eleitoral, ficou mais evidente, mas como era a força da mulher, e nos Estados Unidos elas têm, têm a expressão da, da usuária do welfare state, né? que é uma imagem parecida com a nossa, que se desenhou durante esses governos do PT, que foi a mãe beneficiária do programa social, a mãe do Bolsa Família. E a outra, mãe, a outra imagem de controle também é sobre maternidade, que é, na minha cidade se chama mãe de bandido. O que é a mãe de, de mãe de bandido? Né? É uma imagem cruel, perversa, é, mas, mas essa imagem de mãe de bandido é a seguinte, isso, isso tem sido trabalhado, né? vou até citar aqui uma das autoras que trabalham com isso, uma antropóloga chamada Luciene Rocha, Luciene de Oliveira Rocha, que fez a tese de doutorado dela no Texas, Austin, parte das reflexões que eu estou aqui, tô compartilhando aqui com vocês, vem do trabalho da Luciene. É, quando a gente pensa na sociedade que a gente vive, numa sociedade heteropatriarcal normativa, a figura da mãe é a figura da excelência, né? de toda da perfeição. Uma das figuras mais sagradas que a gente tem é a mãe e a maternidade. Mas o que acontece quando essas mães e essa maternidade é de uma mulher negra em um contexto periférico ou favelado? Toda, toda a sacralidade que a maternidade envolve é tirada dessa mulher. Então, na minha cidade, com frequência, o Estado, a partir da polícia militar, mata jovens, meninos e meninas negros de forma é, inexplicável, mas a gente sabe qual a razão disso, e de forma injustificável. E todas as vezes que essas mães vêm a público enunciar, mostrar a sua dor, elas logo são taxadas de mães de, de bandido, elas são logo taxadas de responsáveis por, por, pelo que aconteceu com aquele menino, com aquela menina, a maternidade dela, a experiência dela de mãe, o cuidado com o filho dela é criminalizado. E, e, e o choro, né? o choro numa sociedade patriarcal é um elemento que as mulheres brancas podem ativar com muito mais facilidade que a gente. O choro de mulheres brancas podem mobilizar, choro de mulheres negras não mobilizam nada. Se a gente chorar, ainda vão passar duas vezes com um caminhão em cima. Todo mundo aprendeu isso em casa. Engole choro, não chora. Se chorar, eu vou te bater mais. A gente não aprendeu isso? A gente aprende desde pequena essa educação cruel de segurar o choro, porque minha mãe sabia que o meu choro não ia mobilizar nada, que eu tinha que ir para a guerra, que eu tinha que ser forte. Então, essa dimensão é, dessa dor das mães negras, das mães consideradas mães de bandido, porque é assim que, que, eles, que elas são tratadas pelo sistema público, por uma série de instituições do próprio Estado, é, evidenciou muito o que, que a interseccionalidade quer dizer. Quer dizer que a gente desmistifica a ideia da maternidade sagrada, a gente desmistifica a ideia de qualquer sensibilidade feminina, porque nós não tivemos historicamente direito isso, a gente reconstrói um contínuo histórico da experiência da maternidade, lá do período da escravidão, quando mulheres negras não tinham jeitos aos seus próprios filhos, 
filhos, e hoje, no pós-abolição, com outra conjuntura, com outro contexto, a maternidade das mulheres negras continuam não sendo é, respeitada, evidenciada, privilegiada. Né? É, é, há um, um contínuo histórico disso. E, e há uma, uma questão, não sei se vocês estão familiarizados com a, a filósofa Denise Ferreira, a Denise Ferreira ela tem uma frase que eu acho muito provocativa, que ela fala porque a morte de pessoas negras é, e violências raciais contra elas não provocam uma crise ética. Né? E aí, eu parafraseando a, a, a fala da, da Denise, eu pergunto por que, que o choro e a dor das mães negras não provocam uma crise ética? A gente viveu isso no Rio, são várias mortes, né? eu não, não acompanho muito, exatamente o que acontece em São Paulo, mas há coisa de duas semanas vocês devem ter acompanhado a morte da Ágata, né? e de como é que o caso do assassinato da Ágata foi muito perverso, uma menina de oito anos, o avô da Ágata, e a Winnie até escreveu sobre isso, o avô da Ágata mobilizou todos os recursos da política da respeitabilidade. Né? Minha filha fazia, minha neta fazia balé, minha neta aprendia inglês, e o avô era o que mais visivelmente assim, afetado com isso, a imprensa destacou muito ele, e, e são mortes como essa, que atinge, né? e é bom falar que quando um jovem ou uma jovem negra é morto, fisicamente o filho morre, mas as mães morrem nesse processo. Né? Se a gente sabe que tem uma coisa que não é natural nesse mundo, a gente pode discutir o que é a natureza humana, daqui até o final do seminário a gente não vai ter um consenso, mas a gente sabe de uma coisa, não é natural, não é da ordem natural que mãe enterre o filho. Isso não é da ordem natural. Né? É uma, um, uma quebra de paradigma do que significa a vida humana. Os que vieram primeiro vão primeiro, os que vieram depois vão depois. É, e, e essa ideia dessa mãe, dessa maternidade, que ela não é, não é respeitada, eu acho que, que evidencia também a inexistência de democracia, né? a existência de valores democráticos numa sociedade como brasileira, porque, como eu citei, todas as representações que eu, que eu mencionei estão muito ligadas com territórios, e são nesses territórios que evidencia a inexistência de democracia. Claro que hoje a gente vive um momento extremado disso, por conta de uma série de, de processos que vem acontecendo desde o impeachment, até hoje é, se, se evidenciou mais, mas se evidenciou mais para uma parte da sociedade. Para a gente, que vive em determinados territórios, que tem determinada cor, a gente sabe que essa democracia nunca existiu. Né? Nunca existiu. E a democracia não existiu quando ela, foi, quando ela surgiu e ela não pensou nenhuma política para os afrodescendentes que saíram do processo de escravidão. Ela sempre foi uma política, uma democracia de ini, é, iniguais, não existe, de desiguais. E não há possibilidade de democracia entre desiguais. A democracia parte do pressuposto que há igualdade. E no Brasil não há igualdade para a população negra e para a população indígena descendente e os indígenas, os povos originários. É, o Winnie já disse que que acabou o meu tempo, eu tinha um monte de, de outras, <risos> obviamente, de outras questões para colocar, mas eu, que, eu queria trazer essa imagem é, desse lugar, dessa experiência, usando esse conceito da Patrícia Ricolas, porque ele abre muitas possibilidades de pensar e refletir, é, e, e pensar que o feminismo negro não é uma política que interessa só as mulheres negras, o feminismo negro é uma perspectiva epistemológica que serve para pensar em projetos democráticos e plurais e repensar o que é a democracia e que democracia nós queremos. Obrigada. Bom, então, gente, foram várias perguntas. Né? Eu vou passar depois para a doutora Collins todas elas, inclusive porque ela está estudando português, ela é uma estudante muito aplicada de português. Está tá indo né? português, então vou passar todas para ela poder estudar o português a partir das perguntas de vocês. É, mas, assim, parte do que vocês perguntaram, a Raquel já mobilizou, né? então... A ideia é um pouco aqui, eu condensei alguns eixos para que a professora possa reagir aos comentários é, da Raquel e também uh, responder um pouco das perguntas de vocês. Eu vou fazê-las, e aí, se, se no meio do caminho a senhora, sei lá, não lembrar de alguma coisa, a gente, eu refaço aqui é, em inglês. Bom, o, uma das questões que apareceu aqui com bastante contundência... Ah, um, um recado importante um monte de perguntas sobre o que as mulheres brancas podem fazer, ou como as mulheres brancas podem reagir, ou o que importa... E, assim, com todo o respeito, a gente está lançando aqui o pensamento feminista negro. Então, eu vou é, trazer as perguntas 
E como eu estudei essa obra com muito rigor, eu passei dois anos na minha vida lendo esse livro, carregando ele para cima e para baixo, eu vou deter as perguntas mais para dentro do escopo da obra, se vocês me dão licença. É... Então, uma das questões que, que apareceu bastante, que eu acho que é interessante, é, pede para a senhora falar um pouco como que, durante esses 30 anos que a senhora tem aí acompanhado o tempo da obra, do livro né, e do próprio pensamento feminista negro, como que essas mudanças na sociedade é, influenciaram a sua forma de falar sobre feminismo negro? Era mais difícil, há 30 anos atrás, quando essa obra foi lançada, falar sobre feminismo negro e hoje é mais fácil? Ou essas coisas continuam mais ou menos no mesmo lugar? É, uma outra pergunta que, que é bastante interessante, é uma pergunta que fala sobre a questão da matriz de dominação, e a pessoa pergunta se a senhora considera o poder policial, o braço armado do Estado, enquanto um domínio estrutural do poder. Né? Então, essa é uma pergunta de alguém que leu o livro, que a pessoa vem com matriz de dominação e domínio estrutural de poder, a pessoa leu o livro. Parabéns para a pessoa que já leu o livro. Chegou, chegou em matriz de dominação, entendeu? De matriz de dominação, leu mesmo. Né? Então, meus parabéns. A terceira é, pergunta fala a respeito... <laughs> okay, these are hard. All right. <laughs> no, keep going. I'll try. Okay, you okay. Me. Uh, é, isso é difícil, né? Mas a gente vamos tentar aí ver o que que acontece. Uh, a terceira que eu que eu juntei aqui com várias que vinham mais ou menos nesse mesmo caminho é a respeito da política das políticas de empoderamento e como que a gente pode fazer uma, uma espécie de um movimento de contingenciamento aqui, né, do termo, inclusive, pensando no esvaziamento do empoderamento a partir de um discurso metodológico que vincula empoderamento aos acessos proporcionados pelo capitalismo. Né? A gente chegou a conversar sobre... Porque eu tomei café com a doutora Patrícia Hill Collins duas vezes. A gente conversou um pouco sobre isso no café da manhã. É, e, por fim... Mas... Que essa também é bastante importante, acho que, tem, que, que é uma coisa que é importante no Brasil, é importante na sua, no seu trabalho, e que a gente não é, aprofundou, que é a questão da centralidade das estratégias de luta das trabalhadoras domésticas nas resistências de mulheres negras. Né? Como a senhora sabe, o Brasil é um país em que 72% das trabalhadoras domésticas são mulheres negras, trabalhadoras que né, é, lutam ainda hoje pelo reconhecimento do seu trabalho enquanto trabalho, e a sua contribuição nesse sentido é muito importante, né, tanto no escopo acadêmico, em termos de pensar como que pensar a categoria trabalho doméstico para o pensamento feminista negro, né, mas também enquanto um reconhecimento das trabalhadoras domésticas como intelectuais, né, como produtoras de conhecimento. E aí a senhora tem 20 minutos aí para falar tudo que a senhora quiser. Para onde a senhora quiser. Ok. <risos> All right, let, you're going to have to help me remember these four questions. All right, but let me just start with the first one, which is the difference was between writing then and writing now or thinking about black feminism 30 years ago and flat, black feminism now in the United States. I think 30 years ago, when I wrote this book, it was considerably easier for a variety of reasons. There was, uh, it was the tail end of a social movement. It was pretty obvious that protest politics had produced all this energetic work in terms of black women's cultural production. There were novels, there were a variety of things. It was new, the novelty of black women. There's this moment when um, there's a discovery of black women as thinkers and doers, and you can almost be seduced by the hype of it all. You're, you know, you're popular, you're in, that kind of thing. And American culture tends to do that. It really wants to consume the new and then move on to the next new. 
So there was a period of time when uh, you saw all this work by black women that really was going into community organizing. Ordinary women were reading uh, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. That was a groundbreaking book. Uh, the, the books that were coming out were really speaking to the issues that black women had at the time. 30 years later, I think I'm now more aware of the um, sort of the, the coming and going of trends. All right, so there was a period of time where black people were not in anymore. But of course, the problems were still there. The issues were still there for black women. But what was happening was ignoring the politics. Life just became harder. It became harder to be heard. It became harder to speak. But ironically, there were more black women who were visible in our institutions. Just because black women are in institutions and are in visible positions and in fact have benefited from affirmative action does not mean that we're looking at tremendous progress. I would talk about American universities in this regard who recognized that the kinds of black women who were advancing black feminism, many of whom had come out of movement settings and then moved into the academy uh, as professors and then as students, as well as as students, um, were over time replaced by different black women who had the color of black, but not necessarily the politics of black feminism. So you have a substitution in plain sight where you think you're seeing what you've always seen and you're celebrating, you're happy to see all these black women, but that raises new questions about what, what is the philosophy, the worldview, and the politics of, of those women. Are those women hopeful? Are they connected to communities? Do they see intersectionality as something that's organic to black feminist struggle? Or do they see it as um, a social theory that just travels anywhere for anyone kind of thing? So what are the politics of those folks? So there was this notion of, I think, hollowing out of black feminism from within in plain sight in those institutional sites. I don't think that's what's happened on grassroots levels at all. I think if anything, you see a shift much more to community politics, to local politics that do not show up on the national graphs of black feminism, but are there nonetheless. People who were, um, starting their own schools or people who had after school programs or black women who were just writing their own stuff or you know poetry and hip hop all of that was going on but it became difficult for me to see that as a period of black feminism so i went through a period of time when i was just simply discouraged i basically said okay i'm going to retire now i can do other things but then when we got into the early 2000s there was a resurgence that began to happen that I began to see. And to be perfectly frank, your movement here energized me to go back and look at what was going on in the US because I never expected there would be like, yeah, I mean, here was just so much excitement about uh, youth and a movement. And when I started looking for black feminism in different places, I had to look in social media, I had to look in places I wasn't looking, um, then I began to see a lot, blogs. I began to see that there's a whole nother generation of younger black women who are, are carrying these ideas forward and massaging them differently. But I, I would say though that, so in some ways it's easier to be heard, but in other ways what is being heard may be more micromanaged if black women aren't in fact thinking about the political economy of how ideas are produced and consumed. You see, so I think that's something that's a little different. And also the communities have changed I mean, uh, dramatically. So you've got a, um, all right, so basically, this is why I'm convinced that this sort of long struggle arc with different constellations of political responses is really the way to think about a long-term struggle. Because if you bite off too small a piece, you could easily just quit and say, we've reached victory. A lot of people, when uh, Michelle Obama was in the White House, they just figured she was their friend forever. It was always going to be like that. Black women had arrived because she's so cool, which she is. I don't know her, but I mean, which she is. 
But we now have Ivanka, whatever her name is, I forgot, Melania, and yeah, you, know, <laughs> you know, as the first lady, and that's a very different, completely different. So this is the thing about um, looking at the structural changes that underlie the ideas that you're advancing and how you have to think about those ideas um, in relation to the here and now and not as universal ideas, which is what I said today in my presentation. So I don't know, I, mean, I guess my answer is I'm still in the moment and I think five years from now or 10 years from now, um, I, it will be clearer what this moment that we're in now actually is. But it's difficult to be in the moment now. Okay, the second one had to do with the matrix of domination. And was that the one? But what was the question exactly, though? Okay, let me just try this one really quickly. <laughs> one thing that I've tried to theorize throughout my career is power. You know, I've come at power from so many different directions because we talk about power all the time, but there's no agreement on what it actually is. And what tends to happen is one group is talking about this is power and another group is talking about that is power. And what I've tried to do is take a step back and say, not what are the major Western theories of power, there are quite a few of them, but if we had to look at everyday life and come up with a language of how to talk about power in everyday life, what would that be? So I've been using this model of domains of power, which I think this is what the person might be asking about, that is a way, see the matrix of domination is power relations of race and class and gender. That's more the intersectional framework of power relations, kind of kinds of power. All right, there's racial power, there's nationalistic power. But this other piece of domains of power is really talking about structural power relations, cultural power relations, um, disciplinary power, the ways in which we are disciplined to go to those assigned places, and interpersonal, or the power of how we treat one another. Now this particular domains of power framework I think is very significant for participatory democracy. Because if you cannot imagine democracy in your everyday life in terms of how you're treating people, equality, equal treatment, equal participation, that acknowledges differences among people. That's what we're working on in everyday life. And we're expected to think about a concept of democracy that scales up from that when it's very difficult to do. So I don't know if you have no concept of democracy as interpersonal relations and pushing back against efforts to discipline us. How do we scale that up to countries as big as Brazil and the United States? These are gigantic countries. What we end up with is an ideal of democracy that you, will, you can never approach. You can't move it forward because inequality slows it down. So anyhow, uh, so that's, there's a lot of ways I've come at this. Uh, and that would be the schema in this particular book. Yeah. All right, and uh, that in other places I talk about different pieces of this particular model. Ooh, what's there? Oh, you, I guess you could say it in English. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Então, a outra pergunta é sobre, e aí a gente vai, eu vou fazer as duas juntas, porque a gente, infelizmente, tem que encerrar, né? Vocês certamente querem pegar o autógrafo da doutora Patrícia Hill Collins nas suas versões traduzidas de O um Pensamento Feminista Negro. Então, uh, a outra pergunta é sobre a questão do empoderamento, das políticas de empoderamento, e como que o termo empoderamento vem sendo esvaziado dentro de um discurso mercadológico que coloca empoderamento relacionado ao acesso proporcionados pelo consumo. E a última é a respeito da questão do trabalho doméstico, né? como que as trabalhadoras domésticas são protagonistas nos processos de resistência de mulheres negras. E em oito minutos. I'll start with domestic workers. Ok. Because, yeah, because this book is grounded in an analysis of black women's work. Black women's work for pay, black women's work not for pay, black women's work uh, that is recognized and not recognized or respected or not. And it argues that the work that you do shapes the way you see the world 
How you spend your time and what you value not only shapes your experiences, it shapes your analysis or your standpoint on the world. So what I would say about black women domestic workers, you can sort of come at this as what should policies be to actually pay people better and those kinds of things. But I think the real power for black women domestic workers is to, is to begin to develop that analysis of how that positioning of black women in Brazil has implications for Brazil bigger than that individual woman. So it could be an organizational response. It could be, um, I just think that's where the power is. That's how I would describe it. Not looking to people to help black women, but to ask, how can you organize yourselves and talk about your lives in ways that provide critical commentary, not just on domestic work, but on academic work, or in work that is, that is dominated by other categories of people, all right? What does the absence of black women from certain types of work mean? in terms of how that work is conceived, defined, et cetera. So I would just be much more aggressive about it, particularly if you have the numbers. Now the question of empowerment is very interesting because what happens with, and I'm gonna say capitalism, is it takes a word and hollows out the resistant potential of that word and leaves you the word. And if it can convince you to attach that word which has meaning to you, empowerment, to turn it into something else and sell it back to you and it makes money on it, this is quite brilliant to be perfectly frank. So if I can convince you to think of empowerment not as a collective endeavor, notice my entire talk, I talked about a collective, I talked about a group, and I can say to you it's all about the individual and this really would be neoliberal philosophy, you know, sort of entering into this. Empowerment's not about a group. Nothing's about groups anymore. It's all about individual heterogeneity and subjectivity, and that's what freedom is. Freedom is for you to do anything you want to do and be whoever you want to be with no obligations or accountability to anyone else. Now, that's actually a very interesting thing to sell people. And if you can attach consumer products to that. Oh, if you like fix your hair a certain way, or if you're wearing a certain pair of boots, or if you have a particular bolsa, that's the word I'm using. All right, you have to learn that when I get that mixed up with many other words, all right? If you are just really stylish or whatever, you can be free and empowered. But it's a form of empowerment that buys into this rhetoric that we can be so separated from everyone else that our fate is not tied and linked to the fate of everyone else. Now a democratic ethos says it is a shared and collective fate. It's a community endeavor. Uh, individuals matter tremendously, but they matter in the context of community. And that is not what this form of empowerment is saying. It's saying you empower yourself by leaving all those other people behind. They are dragging you down. Forget about your ugly relatives. They're too ugly for you to stand next to. You are the beautiful one, and if you do not feel beautiful, then what we will do is sell you anything you need to empower yourself. Now, this is just a very interesting moment in terms of the politics of that. This is where something like cultural politics can be very effective. Because that's a form of cultural politics to convince people of those ideas. But turning that on its head and saying, uh, no, I'm pushing back against the materialism, I'm pushing back against that particular view of um, empowerment. I'm looking for something collective and I'm gonna do it openly and we're gonna do it together, pushes back against that. That's pretty scary. So you wanna just scrape off all your really talented people and convince them they were successful all by themselves. Nobody had anything to do with their empowerment but them. There is no history, there is no community, it's just them and their brilliance. Now who does that sound like to you? What group does that sound like that thinks honestly that it did everything, thought every thought, is the most brilliant group in the world, is the most handsome, is the smartest, and is entitled to run everything and lead? Come on. <laughs> 
It's a good game. <laughs> but I would also say, when a word no longer serves its purpose, you have to move on. Early on, because a lot of black women have resisted the term feminism because they associate it with white women. And early on I said, if the term feminism no longer works, everybody has to leave it behind or reclaim it and continue to redefine it so it means what you want it to mean. And I think that's part of the struggle that's involved here. Same thing with intersectionality. That's a word everybody wants because it's got some power to it. I don't cede the power of that term to other people. Fight for it. So the same thing with a term like this. But the thing is staying ahead of the game. I've learned this from black musicians in the US. Every time mu black music became immensely popular, there was some other black music that no one could do. You know? And I just think that's the way we have to go. Innovation, imagination. All right, I'll stop there. Então, com isso, a gente encerra essa mesa, agradecendo imensamente a presença de vocês, agradecendo o carinho e a generosidade da professora Patrícia Hill Collins, e que vai ter agora um momento com vocês de autógrafo deste livro maravilhoso, que eu recomendo que leiam com muito carinho e atenção, para que realmente a gente entenda a relevância e a importância do pensamento feminista negro. Obrigada.